Good to go. Great. All right. We are recording live. All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of Composites Weekly. Um, today, I've got a couple of guests joining me. Many of you know Peter Hedger with the uh, ACMA. Peter joined me a number of times. Um, I think we're going to be having Peter on more often if he's willing to <laughs> join us on a weekly basis uh, for 2024. It's always fun discussions having Peter join the show. And uh, today we've got Lucas Dillingham. He is the uh, applications director with a company called Brighton Science. And uh, we're going to be discussing some of their technology. Uh, manufacturers in every sector are incorporating promising new processes and materials into product development and production, which often involve coding, sealing, and bonding. And because these molecular interactions are invisible, um, there's always a host of unseen environmental conditions and uh, choices that we make that can comp compromise the surface integrity. So that's where their technology comes in. Um, their technology enables you to confidently assess the surface readiness um, for bonding, uh, coating, sealing uh, at any point of preparation on the part. And this even has some ramifications on mold prep too. And we're gonna get into that. So. Um, with that said, I want to welcome uh, Lucas on the show today. Lucas, thanks for for coming on and joining Peter and I. We we're pretty excited to kind of learn more, um, you know, about the company. I think more, you've been you guys have been around for twenty plus years. Uh, began as the development lab for uh, plasma polymer uh, polymerized coatings, and uh, through some R and D work that led um, by your founder. Uh, you guys have made some serious strides in material science. So I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. So with that said, you know, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Peter. Uh, always happy to show up and talk a little bit about manufacturing and surfaces and sure. I don't know, just trying to build stuff better. Basically. I mean, it's really at the end of the day, it's, um, I mean, I think it helps to give a little bit of context, right? I mean, for, we're based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and for a long time, we were working as a surface analysis and product development lab around surfaces, interfaces, and adhesion. So, you know, like a, a Boeing would come to us or General Motors and, and basically would work with us in kind of two capacities. One capacity would be on the development side. Hey, we're interested in uh, using more advanced materials in a structure right? How, do, how can we make sure that we bond this well? Because we can't use traditional fasteners if we want to get the lightweighting benefits out of it. Um, or on the flip side of that, hey, I got paint peeling off of my my bumper. You know, what's going on, right? Help, right. help me find out that, you know, what right. happened with that problem. And um, we built up a pretty legitimate lab to kind of service those types of clients. But about a decade ago, uh, when I started with the company, we we're about four people. Um, actually, it was longer than that. It was about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we were involved in a, in a program called the Composites Affordability Initiative uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this was really a program, DOD sponsored program looking at why aren't we using more composites in the aerospace industry? Right. I mean, I think at that point, your average uh, Boeing liner had maybe 23 percent composite content right before you got into kind of 737 or 777 mm -hmm. or anything like this. Um, and. One of the reasons, I mean, I, and, and I will say this in general, and Peter, you might have a, a point of view on this. The focus in composites is always so much on the raw material going in, the cost of the raw material going in, and the automation that is needed to actually get the overall par per part cost to a level that is actually applicable to a wide variety of industry uses, right? The advantages of the materials are obvious, right? Great strength, great lightweighting awesome performance, but the, 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 they're so cost prohibitive that it's been a problem. But that's one piece of the equation. But one thing that came out of this composites affordability initiative is once I've made a composite part, now I got to do something with it. Yeah. I've got to bond it. I've got to seal right. it. I've got to code it. I've got to repair it. You know, I've got to do all these things. And yep. people were just, you know, not doing that very well. And so, if we look at that program, one of the big things was like, guys, we don't trust bonding. I can't put a triple seven X wing together and proof load every single one to failure. It yep. doesn't make any sense. And, you know, <laughs> there's no such thing as NDT for bonded structure. It doesn't exist. Right. right. So it, 
you have to take a systems engineering approach. And so one of the things that we had learned over the previous 20 years was, look, guys, 90 percent of failure that occurs in these kinds of assemblies is because something has changed with the surface. It's not right. that we pick the wrong adhesive. It's not that we pick the wrong, you know, the wrong raw material. It's that the surface prep or the storage or the uh, handling of this uh, was not done appropriately for whatever reason. You know, Jim forgot to switch, a, you know, switch something on or somebody walked in after hunting all weekend with, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> let's just say deer scent sprayed all over his jacket. <laughs> right. You know, putting silicones out and out into the, the paint. Sure. Shop. Yeah. Um, and so we said, look, I mean, most there's really three inputs if we want to bond reliably or if we, if we want to bond structure. Let's just let's just stick to structure for a second. There, there's three inputs. It's the chemistry of the adhesive you're applying. It's the way you are applying it, right? Uh, bond thickness, heat, heat, fixed ring, cure time, environmental conditions, whatever those might be. And then it's the surface you're applying them to. And we've got great data on those first two pieces. And we monitor the crap out of them as manufacturers. But right. there's no data on the surface. Yeah. So, so the, yeah. So, so let me ask you this then too, as we're jumping into it on the um, surface, uh, what if you're adding something like a, um, an adhesion promoter or a plasma or, or something along those lines? Like, are you tracking in situ in real time or is this data that you track beforehand and then move it in after that? Yeah. So out of that program, we were contract, we were as a subcontractor to Boeing, we built the first fully portable handheld tool to measure surface energy yeah. production. Okay. And this basically means real time measurement of surface prep, basically surfaces. And, and you can kind of divvy up where you would measure and how, you know, depending on the application. But yeah, as an example, real time measurement of plasma treatment is one way you okay. use this, right? But sure. The, the big thing about this is we've got we've we've created a way to very easily and inexpensively get this data. Now you have to figure out how you're going to like what you're going to do with it. So there's kind of like four main use cases. Like the first one is in the development side of things, material qualification, process development. Hey, am I going to wipe it? Am I going to plasma treat it? What mold release am I going to use? How many cycles can I get, you know, before I've got sure. to reapply that stuff? The next thing is scaling up. Because we know that, you know, the amount of variables that you have when you go to actually scale up to make a bunch of parts increases exponentially. So now I've, demonstra I've demonstrated everything in the lab, but now I've got three people in a supply chain. And I got to make sure that my supplier who's going to make the part is actually sending me what I, what I can work with. Right. That's kind of the next, the next phase. The third phase is quality. Am I doing the same thing every day? Am I creating the exact same surface every day? Whether that's coming out of the tool or after I do a prep or after I store a part you know, in a high bay. And then the fourth thing is problem solving, right? If something's going wrong, I need a common data driven language by which I can actually talk about what, what's happening. Because if we think about surfaces and Jonathan, you teed this up really perfectly at the beginning, we, we care about the first one to 200 molecular layers of a surface. That's where all adhesion force mm -hmm. is happening. If I see a fingerprint, that's 10,000 molecules thick. I mean, that's why you can have two pieces that look identical, one will stick, one won't. Yeah. But they look physically identical. So, you, you know, you got to have a technique that works, that is sensitive to that, that's accurate to that, that is easy enough to use. And so that's what we've been, for the last decade, we've been working on building hardware and software to to deliver that, right? I mean, that, that's really kind of been the main thing. Yeah, because, and, and this is where I'd like to learn a little bit more because, um, <clears throat> I do recognize like what you're, what you're saying makes great sense. So I'm going to read this back to you in a way that maybe I can understand it. And hopefully that'll help the folks that are listening as well. So um, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're trying to level set the understanding of all of the variables, because what we know is we know the chemistry of the adhesive, mm -hmm. right? And we know what the, the subset's going to be. So if it's a metallic to a composite, if we, you can pull a book out of a library that says, here's my metallic and this is what it's going to behave like. And these are the things that stick to it. Here's my composite. And these are the materials in those composites. Obviously the QR of the internal, um, whatever they're doing to make that composite has to be on point. But if it's trackable and measurable, then they're going to have a relatively um, equitable or measurable composite something mm -hmm. right and so if, if i have those two variables that are coming together and then i have the chemistry of the adhesive 
all of that should play out on paper, right? Because then you can trust your supplier of the adhesive. You can trust your builder because they've given you documented proof that they've provided that. The variable that you're saying you can eliminate is the variable of detritus or fingerprints or dust or whatever in real time on the surface of those parts yeah absolutely or, or what that part if it needs to be scuffed what that scuff mark looks like if it needs to be promoted what that promotion looks like and you can track that and say whether or not that that has got to a certain level and that level can be can you can you set it to pre preset it to a certain level where it'll ding if there's not a if it's not hitting the right formulation oh, yeah. Yeah, so so the the way the thing works is, I mean, it's really pretty straightforward. I mean, a lot of folks in the composite industry, uh, if they're on the molding side, maybe they know this tape test where they'll take a piece of tape and stick it on a tool and try and feel how yeah. easy it is to pull off the tool surface, as an example. Another test folks will use really common in uh, painting would be water break, which is where you spray a part down with water and you just watch visually. Does it sheet out or does it beat up? Or if there's any guys in the audience that have ever painted a car, they might mm -hmm. they might know yeah. something about this, right? Or have worked in a body shop. You know, the technology is just quantified water break. It's like a little handheld printer. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're shooting out a tiny little water droplet and we're measuring the interaction of that liquid with the substrate. Mm -hmm. Like if you think of a bonded structure, I mean, and Peter, you're spot on. Like take a piece of composite. You can clamp that up in, in an Instron and you can pull it apart, right? And measure, you know, <laughs> measure its tensile force, you know, t measure the tensile force it takes to break that thing. And it's basically going to match what's in the book. Right. And, but what we, what we can't predict easily, which if we're thinking about bonded structure is so important is what happens at the interface between the mm -hmm. adhesive and the substrate itself, right? I can cure a block of adhesive and right. pull it apart too. Yeah. And right. that's going to behave predictably. But, but that but, interface is the piece that we, we don't know if it's going to work. Right. And that's and control our inputs to that. Can you measure as well, like even some of the, the atmospheric gases that might come into play as well? Because, I mean, there's dust and things that are floating around in the air mm -hmm. that if depending upon the quality controls that they have can only take down certain gases, certain um, volatiles, certain dust to a certain part per million. Right. No, no unless you're operating in space, you're going to have stuff. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Well, and we're not, last time I checked, Elon Musk isn't building stuff in space. <laughs> no, no way. Or, you know, <laughs> just go, to, go, go, go to your average, uh, you know, just, just go to your average MRO facility. I mean, guys, you know, guys are doing bond repair in yeah. a high bay, basically a completely yeah. un exactly uncontrolled environment. And well, I think you this there, but, but can, how, what, at what detail do you guys at Brighton get, get to that? What level do you get to? I should ask. I should say, well, the way I like to say that, Peter, honestly, is we help people settle on where they need to be. Oh, wow. Okay, great. All right. So mm -hmm. not not all systems are created equal. Some are more sensitive than others, right? Mm -hmm. Some are more robust than others. The big thing, I think, and I think this is really important if people want to, want to use composites more and really take full advantage of these kinds of materials, you need to have confidence that you can work with these in a wide variety of environments, which you sure. can if sure. you've got if you've got some information on what's happening and so if you think about and this is a thing i run into this in the automotive space a lot where you've got guys doing a lot more structural bonding now than they used to we're using toughened sealants as a way to try to uh, actually bond up structural components um, and a lot of these automotive guys are just like terrified that they're you know whether or not they can even bond in their engine plants right because you walk in you walk into an engine plant what's it smell like oil yeah. <laughs> you know it's oh, just yeah. vaporized oil in the air that's, that's the last thing you want in a you know? <laughs> you're right it's like the last thing you want in a bond shop right but the but you can bond in those environments you can mm -hmm. but there are there's going to be kind of gross levels where things don't work anymore and the biggest thing is knowing and being able to validate with data that I've got the surface that I have qualified this system to. And it's so, not different today. You know what I mean? Lucas, yeah. let me ask you this, because this is what I'm actually, uh, this is, I'm actually interested in this. Um, yeah. How do you measure that? Is it going to be through spectrometers? Is it visual? Is it yeah. high definition cameras? Yeah, so like, there, there are various ways that you can measure what's going on with the surface. And specifically, we care about surface chemistry. 
right? We're not okay. talking about roughness. We're not talking about how, if you're making the part rougher or not. We're saying, do you have the right chemistry on the surface? Okay. To so get you're not you care care as much than if somebody's taking an SOS pad to be able to get that mechanical adhesion, right? Because there, there's different, maybe maybe you could talk through, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but maybe you could talk through the different fundamental yeah. adhesion properties. Like there's mechanical, there's chemical, there's... Yeah. There's, so there, there are... <laughs> And, um, and then you we could, we could go, uh, you could drill right. it down to the family that you were specifically addressing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's just start with the chemistry piece. There, there's a couple things here. So for measuring surface chemistry, typically you've got to use spectroscopy and there's different ways to do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're usually trying to understand using spectroscopy, kind of what chemical compounds or what elements are present at the top one to 200 molecular layers. And so there are uh, FTIRs that you can use, all right? Standard FTIR is, you know, you're literally hitting the surface with IR and you're reflecting things back into a detector and trying to say, hey, what wavelengths do I see there? And I could say, oh, I've got, X, you know, I've got some carbon, I've got uh, this kind of, I've got a carbonyl, maybe I've got some silicone, like what, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. XPS FTR, is another way. FTR stands for full... For Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Okay, good. That's Just in case someone learned to Google that, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> if the, I mean, guys, we could go. Uh, oh, yeah. I've been doing this a while. We could go deep if you want. I'm trying to, I want to keep we it high. Want to go we just want to go 200 molecules deep. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's basically it. No, well, I mean, that's a great, I mean, you're spot on, man. That's exactly right. Like, you want a detection method that is sensitive to the top 200 molecular layers. Yeah. Most, most guys have SEM. Okay, an electron microscope, and they'll try to use something called EDX, mm -hmm. which is where you put electrons in to get X rays out. Okay, that's too deep. That goes down into the material. It's not. It's mm -hmm. going to tell you what's in the bulk. It's not going to tell you what's going on with the surface. Which is great for looking for um, microfracturing or cure, yeah. lam cure laminates and things like that, but not necessarily for the bonding of the surface. Absolutely right. right. Well, and I mean, you can't blame guy blame guys for trying to use that. It's a tool that's readily sure. available in most manufacturing. <laughs> scenarios and it's what you got so yeah absolutely um so ftir is one way and you specifically want to typically do a solvent extraction to actually get thin film information xps is another way that stands for x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy this is a high vacuum technique you you pump in x-rays to the surface you see what electrons bump basically shoot out and depending sure. on, on how hard and fast those electrons hit the detector you can tell what shell they come from in the atom or in the molecule and you can say, hey, I've got carbon, I've got silica, I've got silica, I've got whatever. High vacuum technique, super powerful. You can learn a lot, but it's like it's literally a million dollar machine and you need almost a PhD to run it. Not practical. Right. Yeah. Right. One sample takes three hours. Um, we have three of those on site. So we, we've got a lot of experience with them. Um, what we're doing is called a water contact angle. Or another way to think of it is a quantified water break test. We're printing a water droplet onto the surface, and we're just measuring how strongly attracted is that water droplet to the surface. And it actually gives you a huge amount of information around what's going on, like how uniform something is. Or if I sand something, did it yeah. actually, uh, did it clean the part? Did it well prepare the part? You mm -hmm. can learn all these things by using that technique. So say you've got Jim and John, and okay. they're, they're running a standard, a standard operating procedure of, wiping something down with alcohol and then sanding it with a, you know, 220 grit sandpaper. You can immediately tell if Jim and John are doing a different job immediately. So, so let me ask you this then. Yeah. You said you developed the first handheld device to be able to detect this stuff. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I hear that correctly? So then if you develop that handheld device, you can immediately tell whether Jim and John did something differently because Bob is in the side looking at this stuff or is this going on? Is it ongoing? Like, how do you set up? Like I got here, here, here let me get, ask you this. Yeah. I got a composite panel yep. and a metallic panel. Yep. I want to stick them together. Yep. And I'm coming to you because I want to know what those surfaces look like. Yep. What am I doing specifically with, is it a, like I'm, I'm and I, I, this is just ignorance, but it's also most of the folks that are probably probably listening are also going to be interested in these type of things as well. Like, what is it that you are actually doing or having or installing or putting this into to be able to measure that? So, and there you go. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for uh, <laughs> throwing this up on the screen. This is super helpful. So uh, this is what we would do. 
we would one consult and or advise on how to clean it. Okay. okay. Let's just take a standard. Sure. You're going to take that, that risk hundred percent. Cause we can, we can measure it. We know. Oh, interesting. Wow. That's nice. We yeah, can that's... correlate it. We can correlate it directly yeah. to fundamental <laughs> adhesion properties. Like we know it, you know, that's why we can take it. It's not, we're not, yeah. wanting, now we, and we don't sell, like we don't make money selling solvent, right. Or sandpaper. Right. That's we don't fair. sell any of that stuff, but we, we sell the knowledge and we sell the ability to validate it in production. So the way this would work as an example is we'd help a customer set up their process. Many times they've got one already, but say we help them set it up. Say it's a solvent Each day light. in the aerospace oh, industry, yeah, factories are producing yeah. some of humanity's <laughs> most <laughs> advanced machines. I was like, I wasn't sure what producing it's going to show, but it looked advanced materials. I was just looking at the, uh, the, the technology. So I was hoping like surface processes. This is a marketing video, so much, here, but it should have on some, the wings of these materials. Some, um, shots of actually working and using a device. Why would any manufacturer? Okay. Oh, cool leave any part of their process so much to be gained from so a this is drop just a hand, all of this technology is pretty much just painting like oh, anything wow. you can do, you can do yeah you can do handheld you can do Grading, inline there's coding. a variety of ways that you can deploy this um, right. if the problem is process the solution is the service so that's a great that would be a great spot to actually pause jonathan on that okay right so Peter, just to, like this is the this is the simple way to do it. Let's just say we've got a cleaning step: mm -hmm. solvent wipe, uh, abrade, solvent wipe, dry wipe. We got four. Mm -hmm. We know that we when we do that process appropriately, we get a certain value out of the device, and there's going to be a number and and a certain standard deviation that goes into the spec or the SOP to say, hey, when you do this process, measure with this tool, and you've got to get between X and Y. And if you don't, you're repeating the process. Mm -hmm. if, you gotta, if you repeat the, if you got to repeat the process three times, then you call the supervisor and then they've got examples on how to actually solve what's going on. Oh man, we say, we tried to save a couple cents on sandpaper this week and we actually bought the wrong sandpaper. I mean, there's so many stories like this. Like yeah. we started recycling our solvent and we're slosh cleaning fasteners in our solvent. And now, now we can't clean the part with our solvent anymore. Um, <laughs> You know, there's all kinds of things like this, but the down and dirty is Jim and John self validate using a meter. It's really, it's very simple. I mean, okay. they, but they're cleaning to a number. <laughs> so they each have their own meter then you don't have Bob on the outside with the meter oh. going, Hey Jim, you're off, John, you're good. Okay. See you later. You know, certain, every manufacturer is a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. If so. we go back to the, the original, so we built this thing under air force and Boeing support. Mm -hmm. Right away, there was a need in Lockheed Martin's F-35 program, right away. Yeah. They had a bunch of bonded fa fasteners falling off the structure. We put the first five units into production at Fort Worth, and we measured 3,000 fasteners, like fastener holes on the structure, over three jets. Those were the first three jets Lockheed had ever produced that didn't have a single bonded fastener failure. Wow. Saved that program tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. So here, Lucas, I'm going to give you an example of a story um, yeah. that kind of casts a vision for why this is important. And mm -hmm. then you can tell me whether or not you've done anything about it since this happened, because this was years ago. So I would say on the probably 10 to 15 years ago, I went to a technology day, shameless plug for the ACMA, because this was before <laughs> I was with the ACMA. Um, they had these technology days with a, a famously smart person named John Bucell, with, also with the ACMA. Um, we went to... Um, uh, Northrop Grumman and toured their facility, which little point of useless information, that plant in San Diego or San Francisco or uh, LA is actually made out of redwood still to this day has redwood that built it. So it smells like a pine forest in there. It's fantastic. Right. But we walk in there and um, Doug Decker uh, previously with Northrop Grumman would have a lot to say about this because he's the one that stood up in front of our entire group and with passion in his voice said, we would absolutely love to bond our beautiful carbon fiber parts together, but we cannot consistently prove that those parts aren't going to, we need a hundred, 100% 100 accuracy, not yeah. 99.9999999. Right. They can't get that right. Because <clears throat> that they can test right now is they bend to failure so they they, yeah. they they break it and then what about the ones that they didn't break right how do they know that those actually work so they were talking about embedded sensors 
they were talking about um, different techniques and technologies that they had on time on at the time to be able to get past there. But he had nothing. And so because he had nothing that was consistent, they now introduce foreign matter. Right. They introduce mm -hmm. mechanical fasteners. And when you take a beautiful piece of carbon fiber, and I don't care how good your drilling process is. And you begin poking holes and perforating a piece of carbon fiber you're weakening its overall structure and so the better way to manufacture with a composite is an adhesive um, and there are people in, in in areas where people will disagree with me and, and they're welcome to because you can mechanically fasten i'm not saying you can't i'm just saying that the ideal scenario is having a continuous bond rather than bonds that are pointed on there because you run into all sorts of issues with um, micro fracturing and yeah. um and <clears throat> uh mechanical failure as well as in an aircraft now you've got foreign matter foreign debris right rattling around at 600 miles an hour inside of a jet it's not a good thing yeah. and so what i'm asking you is when after i went through that technology day i actually went through a bunch of embedded uh sensors in order to try to help them solve that problem and met with a bunch of folks why i did that jonathan you know this we we're i was working with mvp at the time we had no business in that market whatsoever we built yeah. pumps and Right. So, <laughs> right. Um, but I was curious. And so out of that curiosity, curiosity, I'd done right. my own research. And so I'm fascinated to understand, do you feel like this is something that can contribute toward the ending or the progression of that type of oh. testing? I mean, yeah, hundred percent. And we've demonstrated it. Bold answer. I like that. 100%. <laughs> I mean, and we've demonstrated 100%. it like it's a, uh, I mean, look, there, there are limitations to every technology, all right? And yeah. I could go down a road around, hey, you know, look, we're not going to be a great fit here. We, you know, this won't work so well. And I mean, it's it's just like anything. There's areas where this makes a lot of sense and areas where, where this makes less sense. Um, you know, I would, it's, uh, Doug has intimate familiarity with what we do. Okay, great. And uh, great. he, I think that he would change his approach with his own, I mean, healthy caveats right or again sure. around where this fits sure. and where this doesn't fit but look i mean at the end of the day where when we're building parts as manufacturers where do problems occur they don't occur in the laboratory they they occur on the floor they occur when i'm up on a wind turbine blade trying to cut out yeah. a scarf in a pack <clears throat> that's where that's yes, where the they issues are yes they are and so, you know, what we're talking about here is applying data and a common language to surface prep or on, the, again, if we tie it back into molding, right, just surfaces in general, so that we've got something that's quick and easy to give us more confidence around what we're building. Does it, is it going to measure every, you know, is it a perfect piece of technology? No. Is it bet, way better than anything anybody's doing today? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> sure. You know, a lot of a lot of times people and it, I'll say this, it is a point measurement, right? It's a spot. Yeah. Check. And so for larger structure, you got to grid out that structure and understand how to map it and how many measurements to take to have to get some kind of statistical mm -hmm. confidence interval. And sometimes that's a sticking point for guys working on larger composite pieces. Um, you know, but my my response to that always is some data is 100 percent better than none. And right now. People are yeah. operating with none. Zero. Yeah. yeah. We were talking, remember, uh, <clears throat> Peter, we had a guest on talking about uh, months ago. And, and I think, Lucas, we talked about this when we've had a previous conversation, just the guys with the uh, the Titan submersible. Mm -hmm. You know, the point of failures, I think, and, I, you know, there's still a lot of ongoing investigation, <laughs> but it's it's right there at the seams, right? The, the seam uh, joints were certainly compromised i mean by i mean by yeah some of the research and analysis that's gone into the after you know a lot of the debris and 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 obviously yeah. that was a failure point so um yeah. you know things like this can be and i i can't remember if if the consensus was that it was mechanically you know if they were mechanical or uh obviously it's probably a little bit of both who knows but there was a lot of neglect <laughs> It was a lot of failure and neglect um, throughout that whole process, so it's hard to identify which which area. I'm sure. Yeah, and that was that. So just real quick, um, that obviously we want to um, uh, give our thoughts and prayers out to the family. That yeah. tragedy it was yeah. it was a tragedy, and and but what we're coming to understand is that 
Um, and there was some research actually done and we we're talked about uh, this past week in Salt Lake City at the, there was actually a whole section on the Titan submersible and, and a couple of research studies that are going on. And what we're realizing is that now's the time necessarily not to poke blame, but to find out what we learned. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good um, replicative studies that are going on right now to determine whether or not carbon fiber should be used under that kind of collapsible pressure because mm -hmm. you, you, carbon fiber can take that kind of compressive stretch pressure. It, it just has to be manufactured well and right and thoughtfully. And, and, and not that it wasn't, but when you go down to those pressures, you start getting that contraction and, and, we, we talked yeah. about it. go check out the previous podcast because we talked yeah. all about it. the yeah. point yeah. is i think to your point is um understanding lucas do you think that monitoring those um specific um areas would have made a difference monitoring and what i say monitoring do you think I mean, that this, this, because there was a ceiling if this if let's let's hypothesize that the ceiling of those seams was the one of the failure modes, obviously catastrophic failure. Yep. Uh, then do you think that that is an area where you would say this would be, could be an example of where we should have been utilized? I mean, my, my question when faced with something like that, my question would be twofold. Mm -hmm. uh, one, did they pay to, did they pay much attention to initial surface prep? It's usually, it's kind of the spot where guys act. It's usually the last thing people worry about right? They think about adhesive selection and material selection first. Um, that, that would be question one. And then question two is, are, is anyone thinking about bond durability? You've got two dissimilar materials, one which is metallic and you're putting it in seawater. Yeah. If you're not putting a conversion coating on that, what was it? Titanium? It was the end cap like titanium. What was it? Titanium or something? Yes. If, if you're not putting a conversion coating on that titanium, good luck. Right. That's not, it's literally not going to last. I mean, the Navy figured this out in the fifties. Well, even with the conversion coating, isn't there a shelf life on that? Yeah. Well, yes, but I mean, we're not talking, I mean, you have F-18s that are, have metal structural bonds that operate on aircraft carriers and they've been operating that way for 30 years. I mean, it's not. So, uh, well, let me ask you this. Is there a, so on the forces that are pressured on an F-18 going at the speeds that they're going with the G forces that they're encountering, is there a similarity between that and maybe um, 30 atmospheres of water pressure? I can't, I can't effectively answer that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to, I, we'd have to do some math. I'm not sure. I mean, the, but, you know, look, if, if the, if you've got, if you have a bond of dissimilar materials and it's going to be in a corrosive environment and it's under extreme pressure, I would be thinking about bond durability, not just initial strength. And I just don't yeah. know what those guys did. Fair enough. I, yep. That's that's what I would, that, and I'd be asking those questions. Hey, did anybody do wedge crack testing on this before actually building yeah. something, right? Did anybody look, did anybody look at this? Cause you know, it didn't fail right away, right? They made some dives. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. So, and that's a classic thing. I mean, cause you can get good initial strengths in, right. just in metal to composite or metal to metal bonds. You can get great initial strengths, but you operate them out in the environment. They literally will just fall apart because that material is so high energy. It's so reactive. It draws in moisture from the outside of the bond line yep. and grows the oxide under the adhesive and it gets weak over time. And that's a thing that a lot of folks, the Navy understands this, but a lot of folks in industry that are utilizing bonding and advanced materials for the first time don't think about durability much. They only worry about initial strength. And, you know, our technology, as an example, our technology is, qual is qualified now on F-18 for sol gel metal bond repair. Because when they've experienced issues on that particular process in repair, it's because they didn't get the aluminum clean enough before applying the sol gel conversion coating. You got to get that aluminum freaking pristine because what it's not that the adhesive lifts off the sol gel, it's that the sol gel lifts off the aluminum. Yeah, that's right. Sure. That's exactly right. Yep. So, so, so how I'm curious, how do you guys work with, um, you work with R and D and product development teams out there. Do you, do you license or is this, is, is the technology licensed to a company that, that wants yeah, so, to so involve in the I process. Mean, we work with people in a variety of ways, right? Like they, okay. you can, people can just buy hardware. 
Mm-hmm. So like as an example, Nyar has bought uh, inline systems as part of their Jarvis, dem- you know, bond repair demonstrators. So they do they can do inline measurement there. Um, the new thing that we came out this year uh, with this year that I'm really excited about is called B Connect. And this is a new handheld device with software platform that's it's all connected. And so it allows you to say create a, you could be sitting right where you're sitting right now, Jonathan, in the podcast booth. You could create a little experiment, publish it to whoever's got access to an instrument. They would have a picture of the part pop up on the instrument and it just walks them through the test. And then you get the data back into your browser in real time. Oh, wow. And that's been, that's been cool. That's so like cool. you can be sitting anywhere in the world and be getting yeah. this data. So if I'm I'm making a, a golf club in California or sorry, I'm designing a golf club in California, but I'm sure bonding up composite in Taiwan, I can make sure the grip blast process is legit mm-hmm. right? or amazing. whatever it is. That's you're awesome. Using, right. Yeah. So that's that's been a big advancement because it takes it's packaging our materials and process expertise and it's actually packaging it in, into software. So you get to scale it to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get to yeah. democratize that information. Sure. Um, yeah. which is pretty exciting. And no, that's that's, that's okay. subscription. Sorry, that's what I was getting to. Is that that is a subscription piece. So okay. All right. Dang it. You don't you don't own the you don't own the hardware. <laughs> you, you don't have to worry about owning the hardware there. Right, right. Just uh so on the flip side, you know, we talk about adhesion, but we yeah. can also talk about on the flip side because this works just as well with companies that are pulling, you know, pulling parts. Mm-hmm. So you're testing the the surface um, performance, mm-hmm. you know, as you're because you know, I mean, Peter, you know, we're, we're we've been in this industry a long time, and and we've seen everything. You know, people that say they they've they properly prepared a mold, uh, you know, from a you know, spe- and we're referencing a composite mold, but um, but yeah, I mean, obviously they work with their mold release company, whoever that is. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, there's things that are neglected in that process. And, you know, you mentioned, you referenced, and we, we've we talked to about the tape test, which mm-hmm. has been used for years. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, this technology can obviously be applied to, you know, to, to mold prep as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, so, we've spent a, a lot of time today talking about things sticking together. Yeah. You know, if, if we go, if we go back to uh, just Camax a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it was so funny. You know, I had I had some younger <laughs> folks with me, you know, in the booth and they're, you know, talking to folks and they're like, hey, do you like do you bond coat, paint, seal or clean? And everyone's yeah. like, what? No. And they're like, wait, and do you want things to not stick? And everyone's like, yes, I definitely <laughs> want things to not stick. Right. Um, and yeah, that's a whole nother side of the coin. It's like yeah. we need those surfaces to be hydrophobic mm-hmm. and yeah. we need those parts to release well. That's right. And what is considered maybe a contaminant in bonding, sealing, or coating yeah. is 1,000% necessary on the molding side. So how much are people going to hate you then if that becomes a standard <laughs> operating procedure? Where like Bob's like, yeah, I totally prepped it right. I totally did it right. And then you're like, man, eh, you know, uh, you're not. Yeah. You uh, the tech says know, otherwise. <laughs> you know, that um, you run into that, of yeah. course. You know, it's, it's right. just part of change. And like people sure. aren't, it's nobody's fault. We make mm-hmm. we're making the invisible visible. Oh, Lucas, it was Bob's fault. We just established that. Bob did <laughs> yeah, not the job when you showed him that he yeah, didn't you know, do it. You want to bring guys along for the journey, though. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's an <laughs> opportunity right. to improve. It's that's that's an opportunity to grow. Yeah. Yeah, it's an opportunity <laughs> to grow. And yeah, you know, that's a thing, right? If you've got an you've got a you've got a workforce of a of a particular age, you know, they've yeah. been doing they've been doing some a particular that's way right. for 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I mean that's some folks. Yeah, I'm sure you got a lot of questions stuff. at the booth, like from people that have been in doing this for a long time. You know, is there a level of skepticism that said, "Ah, come on," you know? I'd love to hear some some folks I know would have some skepticism. I'd love to hear their comments. Oh, yeah. you know, it's um, <laughs> look, there's there there's not much, there's no way to replace kind of a lifetime of experience and expertise sure yeah you can't you can't replace that you know and that's not certainly that's not what we're doing it's just another it's another tool in the toolkit absolutely get some some information that we just don't have right now and maybe what it does is it confirms that you're doing everything great so lucas it's basically saying so you're telling me i've got a magic wand that i can get the surface adhesion properties exactly right every time (laughs) yeah right i mean that's what you're saying you have right you've Uh, got the magic I mean, okay. it's, I can tell you exactly what your surface looks like down to the molecule. 
Yeah. Right. It's I guess my, my question is too, is like, why aren't like, why would not, I mean, you probably have had companies like mold release companies uh, would reach out to you because I think it seems like this would be beneficial to yeah. in, in their cause as well, working yeah. with their customers. Well, you know, I mean, look, if you, if you can imagine a world where a mold release provider, I mean, it's an industry 4.0 store yeah. is what it mm -hmm. is. I mean, you can imagine a world where your tech, you know, your technical service or tech support at mold release company A can just ship one of these things anywhere in the world and say, hey, let's see how you're doing. Or yeah. they got a client who's asking them, hey, look, I want to buy your stuff. I need to make sure it lasts me X amount of cycles. And I'm right. worried about this corner of the tool, you know, that's hard to reach. You can validate all that. Yeah. Right. You can literally validate the performance of the product. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, the, it was for the lack of technology like this, Lucas, that Elon Musk now has a love affair with stainless steel. Because you, you you think okay, he's, he's no, he, he really does. Like in his uh, yeah. recent biography by Walter Isaacson, he, he talked about how him and steel just need to get a bedroom because he's just so in love with high strength steel. <laughs> but the point that he was making was there were so many inconsistencies with his. They used to have fiberglass and composites in the Tesla, in the rockets, mm -hmm. in the things that he's building because lightweight and strong makes all the difference in the world for him. But guess what? He couldn't get the consistency. He couldn't get the, the when he's putting those things together, whether it was a fiberglass sheet on the outside of a solar panel or whether it was a yeah. fiberglass air carriage for his Tesla he, or, or for the rockets, right? The rockets were failing because he couldn't get consistency when he's assembling this yeah. stuff. Industry 4.0, sure, yeah, it makes a lot of good sense. But it's for the lack of this type of technology that folks like Elon Musk are now building things out of high strength stainless instead of something that would, might actually be lighter weight and strong. Mm -hmm. It's sure. true. I mean, I think if you look at the development of the composites industry it was an industry that really was so it's, it's been so cottage for so long really yeah. i mean you're, if, you, if you were talking to guys about composites 30 years ago yep. uh, your average guy would be thinking about like making a fiberglass canoe or maybe a bird rutan <laughs> kit plane or something or a trash can yeah. right you know like that's that's how <laughs> that's and it was like a very cottage thing and it, and what that means, that's not a negative. I mean, it's, right. it's, cool. it's it was artisanal. It's been based in tribal knowledge. I mean, look 100%. at the hypersonic stuff. I mean, it's like, you know, guy, you know, that carbon carbon, it's like a black art. It and is. So yeah. We're trying to put some science and some data to what to these recipes. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we've been doing it for a decade. We've learned a heck of a lot. Sorry, what? Can you read carbon carbon too? You can read, I don't. I don't know how useful it is yet. That's something I'm trying to investigate. Yeah, I don't know how useful. I don't know how useful this information is in carbon carbon. It's. It, but the analogy is just kind of like, you know, we we put these things together, but we still struggle with high reliability. Okay. We don't have enough information. And, and yeah, I let just, me know when you use that carbon carbon. That'd be cool. Well, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I Peter, you're just doing such a good job of tying these topics back to the the broader picture of the industry as a whole and the use of these materials, whether that's from, you know, destroying a beautiful panel by punching a hole in it, you yeah. know, <laughs> any, any of the, I mean, it's, it's all so true. And it's like, you could use this stuff so much more <clears throat> if we had more information about how to put it right. together. That's right. That's right. Have you, um, there's the, have you ever been to the assembly show? I personally have not. Some some of my colleagues have. Okay, I, I gotta imagine that that's that's of importance, right? Knowing because it it extends out beyond just adhesion. Even though adhesion makes the most sense right out of the gate, when you're yeah. putting two things together, there's going to be that. There's always that barrier in between of air and what is in the air and what is on the surface that got left there because of the air. Um, for all kinds of things from antimicrobial coatings and antimicrobial um, just atmospheres, right, and being able to identify is there growth on my wall in my surgery room when I'm going to make an Ebola procedure or a, yeah. or we're trying to cleanse the COVID from the area so that we can treat the people in the camps in Gaza Strip now because disease is going to be better, worse than any of those bombs that are being dropped, right? You got all these people living in close quarters and it's the winter time and all these diseases are going to be running amok. So how do we sense the surface area or this not surface area, but the surfaces in those clean rooms where they're being treated, making sure that we're not making the problem worse? You know, we won't, uh, our technology won't be sensitive to biologicals, but one thing I did learn, and I learned this from a, from a, uh, 
provider of precision cleaning chemistry for sterilization of implants. You have to get surfaces super freaking clean of industrial soils so that you don't give much for a biological to latch onto or grow onto. So like moving organics is super important. And just hydrocarbons, as an example, like right. getting oils off of a surface is key because oils are breeding grounds for bacteria. Mm -hmm. right. um, so our technology well, is used in the medical space to, to validate and monitor precision cleaning of, of metallics and ceramics. Um, it's yeah, used, so all that it's all the same frame. It has to be used for antimicrobial because um, hydrophobics, by by the, the sheer definition of what a hydrophobic is, is antimicrobial because you can't have bacteria without water, right? Um, right. And so if you're if you're if you are measuring by a water droplet, you should have pretty good indication of whether or not that surface is hydrophobic. And if it is hydrophobic, then you yes. should have indications on whether or not that surface can be naturally antimicrobial, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's been, it's been, uh, I mean, we're still on this, you know, it's sometimes it's, um, it's always amazing. I go to any kind of conference or have conversations like this and, you know, even though I've, I've been putting these out there for 10 years, it's like still nobody knows this stuff exists. And so yeah, I yeah. think about like, you know, 10 year, you know, or 20 years to an over to an overnight success or something. I don't know, but, oh yeah. Um, it, By the way, I didn't realize, so yeah. I, I kind of glossed over at the beginning, but your yeah. dad, was it your father that was a founder? Gu yes. Giles? Yes. Okay. Yep. My father founded the company, PhD material scientist. That's um, cool. That's awesome. That is cool. Yeah. This was his, I mean, this, this was his thing. So when I joined, we were four people and like the first prototype was there. So it's, I mean... We went from we went from no essentially some service revenue and some like small business innovation research grants to mm -hmm. you know funding a team of of fifty people on this technology. I mean, just uh, really really been kind of pushing the forefront, and and we're really very serious about educating the marketplace around this stuff. I mean, yeah, we do sell like we sell things. I mean, you know, we are we do sell hardware, but. Sometimes sure. people, sometimes people don't even realize that because they're just like, Wait, you just taught me all this stuff. Like, <laughs> do I buy something from you? Like, what, is, what, is, what am I doing? Yeah. So no, that's awesome, man. Uh, so you guys are working with some of the uh, some universities as well, I'm sure. You know, we don't actually we don't have that much of a footprint in the educational okay. higher ed space. I mean, it's really. Yeah. I mean, very, I mean, I think we could do a lot more. I'd love to put together almost like a higher ed program, especially for this B connect platform. I think it'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, the database of information that we're starting to generate, it's, it's a giant materials library. You, uh, okay. So it's you, cool. um, yeah, we'd love to get you, we'd love to host you down at the university of Tennessee for sure. Okay. Definitely. Uh, there's stuff yeah. going on with, uh, Dr. Uday Vadia and Dr. Uh, uh, Dakar Penamadu as okay. well some of their research on um, not destructive testing methods, but also in bonding in general. Um, okay. I'm sure that they would, and there's some new labs coming in for composites. It's becoming a hotbed. The University of Tennessee, shout out to them, Go Big Orange. They're really doing a lot for uh, nice. for the advancement of composites. Yeah, no, I'd love, I'd love to make the connection and yeah, see if there's something maybe we could collaborate on. It'd be cool. Absolutely. They, do, are you guys connected on LinkedIn? So uh, I'll love Something's going on. We're losing him. Pete, are you there? All right, I'm back. Okay. There we go. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't think yeah. I'm connected with Peter on LinkedIn, but I will definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That would be great. Yeah, it would be great to have you down here. And um, as Peter said, this is it's it's becoming this area alone is like a hotbed now for yeah. Uh, for and I gotta imagine Oak Ridge National Labs would have uh, lots of great opportunities too. Um yeah. and some of the, I mean, even even thinking about right adhesives or not adhesives, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about um, additive manufacturing, layer to layer, Yeah, mm -hmm. one of those layers, right? They've got all kinds of stuff that they're trying to drop in on that to be like, okay, I'm taking this bead and it's laying over this bead. Should we smush it? Should we squish it? Should yeah. we spread it out? Like, how are these beads are sticking, these together? sticking together? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, a lot of, on the research side of things, I think there, there's a lot of opportunity to look at surface properties. And, and just kind of how things interact at that level. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, um, and the, there's new, t there's new detection methods and new technologies that were actually, that are in development right now uh, that are not based on measuring water droplets. Um, 
but the water droplet method works pretty darn well for a lot of things and it's a great starting point too because it's just it's so easy it sounds like a lot of fun <laughs> it like, is I'd love, I'd love to totally fun. see that camera. i'd love to see it actually working in real time i think that sounds yeah. awesome i've always loved to look at the small because there's a huge universe out there but um the more mm -hmm. you go out you get the more you realize there's a lot there's just as much on the minute minutia when you start getting into quantum and the smaller realms not really accurately depicted by the quantum mania with ant-man which I is know, I, was gonna, I was gonna say sometimes i feel like i'm in a uh, uh i'm i'm in a paul rudd movie i guess <laughs> yeah. like dig it getting way deep in there yeah 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 well, I think how, can, uh, how can our listeners learn more? I mean, uh, we want to point them. I got, you know, we've had your website up here. You know, for honestly, time. yeah, honestly, Jonathan, <laughs> best thing, check out the website. Yeah. Brighton-science.com. Yep. Um, connect. You know, obviously, you, anyone can connect with me on LinkedIn if they want to. We're super happy to talk. Um, yeah. Love to collaborate. How big's your, um, how big's your team? Like 50, something like okay. 50, 55. We've got it. We have, so we have two offices. So headquarters is in Cincinnati. So we have okay. a lab here and here's where we're doing like prototyping and production. And then we've also got a satellite office in Minneapolis. Um, and then that's a lot of software engineering. And then we've also got various international channel partners that do distribution. So okay. we're pretty well represented globally. I mean, we've, we've got technology and devices and projects kind of on all continents. Um, so yeah, so you know, niche definitely kind of a niche thing, but growing very and, much. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's it's fun. We're solving it, problems all the time. You know, I've spent some time. You got you got got. I mean, you've got several case studies on your website. So if people want to learn more and just some yep. examples of where um, surface readiness. You know, just kind of some stories because you I'm, you've worked with. Obviously, you mentioned the um, the F thirty five program, and then you know, there's. Uh, there's all sorts of case studies on the website that talk about, um, you know, how you've worked with, you know, composite applications and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, the technology is fascinating. It's just, it blows my mind. I'm like, when it was brought to my attention, when we first talked, it's like, I mean, how is it that companies like, you know, in the mold, you know, in the bold release applications sector are like just jumping on board and reaching out to you guys and just saying, Hey, <laughs> you know, it's just a, uh, you know, probably an awareness thing. I yeah. started, I mean, Camex was great for that. Oh, program, I think, yeah. Actually. I mean, that was really good. We did end up connecting with a few and have some conversations happening. So was that your first Camex? Uh, not the first one. I mean, oh, I, okay. but, but we didn't, you know, of course, like a lot of companies, we kind of dropped off on trade shows yeah, for a right. while. And um, it was definitely the bigger, like the, I think maybe the biggest one that we've been to. Um, yeah. I recommend you come to the next one too in San Diego, 10th anniversary, right? Yeah. That's a hotbed mm -hmm. for there. Maybe we'll get old sure. Elon Musk to show up on that one. To SpaceX <laughs> down there. You need, uh, well, you need to get Charlie Cumin. That's who you need. Yeah. He's Mr. Yep. He's Mr. Stainless. Yeah. Or just get shot well down there from SpaceX. Just somebody to start giving them some some evidence that there's there's opportunity outside of yep. sweet, sweet stainless steel. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Well, Lucas, it's been a pleasure, man. I we appreciate you coming on and and uh you know it's it's always fun to to learn about the technology and we'll be posting a link on the website and how people can learn more about you. And Peter, I, I appreciate you being on as well, uh, yeah, sharing brother. your insights and look forward to uh, doing some more. You know, we've got an, another episode up, upcoming on Friday. Um, fun one. Uh, we'll yeah, be talking be wind energy, just like um, I'm, I'm sure you've got a lot more to say about that uh, given last week. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, so, it's going to be interesting. And our guests, I'm sure, will also have a lot to say about it. Very oh, well yeah, spoken. Steve. I'm, I'm, in, I'm looking forward to talking with him. It should be, should yeah, be a lot of fun. Be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lucas, have have a great week, man. We really appreciate your time today on the show really? and, and really? Uh, hope you have a, a, a great rest of the week and best of success to you all. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Peter, great to meet you. Uh, really yeah, appreciate it. Like